There's been a lot of discussion lately about the removal of statues and monuments that depict Confederate soldiers. This discussion has expanded beyond the southern states as the entire country explores what to do with statues and monuments that some might find offensive. After the incredibly tragic events of Charlottesville, North Carolina, that resulted in the deaths of three people stemming from demonstrations about the removal of a monument of Confederate General Robert E. Lee, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio has named a commission to help decide what to do with statues and monuments that some people might find offensive here in the city. It's a tricky subject. Where do we draw the line between tearing down our history and removing symbols that no longer represent American ideals? This week, we are exploring some of these statues that might be on the chopping block. We gotta start with Christopher Columbus. There are multiple statues of him around the city, two in and around Central Park. This here is Columbus Circle, built up in 1892 for the 400-year anniversary of his discovery of the New World. What he found was a discovery to him, but he in no way discovered America. He's also credited for proving that the Earth was round, which he didn't. He also never set foot on North America, only in the Caribbean. He actually thought he was in India. What he did do was torture, enslave, and kill hundreds of thousands of indigenous people. And now he's got a national holiday. And why he's thought of so highly, we do discuss in a previous episode, Washington Irving Revisited. But should these sculptures remain? Many people believe they should not, and that's proven with the multiple defacements of his statues around the city. Cleopatra's Needle is the oldest outdoor sculpture in New York City. It dates back as far as 1600 BC. It was built in ancient Egypt, therefore it was built by slaves. So was the White House. Shorakopic Rock marks the location of where Peter Minuit supposedly bought the island of Manhattan from the Lenape and Mohawk tribes back in 1626 for a trunk full of trinkets that would be valued at about 60 guilders. The thing is, if this event actually took place, the native tribes had no concept of land ownership. They would think that they were being given a gift of gratitude to share the land. But we know that's not how things worked out. Peter Stuyvesant, the first director general of New Amsterdam, which is now New York City, was a blatant anti-Semite who tried to keep Jews from coming into his colony, calling them a deceitful race. This is Dr. James Marion Sims, considered the father of modern gynecology, who practiced the unethical use of enslaved African-American women on which to experiment. This is in East Harlem. Daniel Webster did a lot for this country, and he did his best to stop the Civil War, which included the Compromise of 1850, which resulted in the Fugitive Slave Act, wherein the federal government could actively pursue escaped slaves and return them to their owners as if they were stolen property. But they were people. Season one, episode one, we explored the Charging Bull versus the Fearless Girl. It's been about eight months since the Fearless Girl showed up. It's also 9.30 in the morning on a Tuesday. Still drawing a crowd. The Fearless Girl is here to promote gender diversity in the workplace, but consequently change the context of the Charging Bull, who's supposed to be a good luck charm for the financial district. Now he looks like a violent antagonist trying to mow down a little girl. Also, why are female professionals being depicted as a little girl? Since the arrival of the Fearless Girl, there have been many instances of resistance towards her presence, including the temporary installation of the Pissing Pug, which attempted to change her context. She's here to promote gender diversity in the workplace and funded by State Street Global Advisors. However, on October 7th, The Guardian reported that State Street Global Advisors, quote, rejected shareholder proposals to tackle gender inequality at least 12 times in 2017. What the f We've got our controversial Civil War monuments as well. This is Grant's tomb. There's also a statue of him in Brooklyn. General Ulysses S. Grant was pivotal in the Union's victory during the Civil War. He also became President of the United States, but in 1862, he ordered the removal of all Jews from Mississippi, Tennessee, and Kentucky. This was called Order Number 11 and was rescinded almost immediately by President Abraham Lincoln. Who's buried in Grant's tomb? Nobody. He's entombed here with his wife, Julia. Semantics, I know. This is the second oldest major monument in a New York City park and is currently the location of a television shoot. General William Jenkins Worth was a famous general of the Mexican-American War who sent out search and destroy parties, burning villages and murdering many Native Americans in Florida. After only two years of his campaign, only 300 indigenous people remained in Florida. And finally, William Tecumseh Sherman, most infamously remembered for his scorched earth campaign. He burned down Atlanta. He burnt down a lot. The goal was to destroy government buildings and artillery resources, but civilian homes were lost too. 
His campaign resulted in the deaths of many innocent people and over $100 million in destroyed property. He did fight for the Union. He fought against slavery, but he was also outspokenly racist. And the story continues. Just one week before we shot this episode, this statue of President Theodore Roosevelt, which has been standing outside the American Museum of Natural History since 1936, was desecrated with fake blood by individuals who find Roosevelt and this statue representative of white supremacy as he strides on his horse above an African and Native American. So what's the takeaway from all this? We don't presume to have the answers or to begin to propose solutions, only initiate the conversation. I suppose we need to look not at what the statue is, but what it symbolizes. Yes, George Washington did own slaves, but his monuments represent patriotism, leadership, freedom from tyranny, just to name a few. What does a statue that depicts an individual whose goal was to decimate an entire people represent? What does a monument that depicts an individual who fought to preserve slavery symbolize? We want to hear from you.